Now, if you had the Pokemon ringtone, that would be fun. <laughs> I don't know the song. Do you know the song? I think you should sing it. I, I, can't, I feel like I could find it on YouTube, but like. <laughs> cool, it's 10.45, so I guess I should get started. Welcome to OP the Pokemon Journey. Um, if you don't already know, this is a beginner backend session. We're gonna learn a little bit of code, but we're gonna do it in a really fun way. I think it's gonna be great. Um, I hope you enjoy it, and feel free to give me feedback afterwards. Um, so let's get started. My name is Fatima. You might know me as Sugar Overflow. That's a really great picture of me. <laughs> um, I work at Digital Echidna. The Red Jerseys, we're a digital services company in London, Canada. We do a lot of Drupal. Um, and I'm also on the leadership board for Drupal Diversity and Inclusion. And if you haven't already, please come to our booth and get your picture taken. Um, there's a couple of people filing in, but I'm just gonna get started. Today we're gonna learn object-oriented programming from the perspective of Pokemon. We're gonna go on this journey to become the best Pokemon trainers ever, and on the way we're just gonna learn a little bit of code. Um, and so all Pokemon journeys begin with visiting Professor Oak at his lab, where we get to pick our starter Pokemon, which is the Pikachu. Um, and so as we start our journey, we're like, hey, Pikachu's a Pokemon, but you know, what is Pikachu and what can it do? So we'll take a look at our first Pokemon and sort of do a little data modeling and talk about what we know about our Pikachu. We know that its name is Pikachu um, and its type is electric and its attack is called a Thunderbolt. So this kind of tells us that, hey, we have some data points about this thing that's a Pokemon. Um, and those data points are the type and that it has an attack. We have this thing and it's got data points. But how do we take this data and model it into code? And OOP gives us this really cool concept called classes that allows us to do this. Classes are like blueprints. Um, there are two components of classes. One of the components is properties. I like to think of properties as data points, something like the type of our Pokemon or the name of our Pokemon. Um, classes also have methods. You can think of them as class-specific functions. These are things that your class can do. For example, Pikachu can attack. Um, so now, that we're talking about what classes are, we can go ahead and define a Pokemon class. But I'm gonna take a break and let you look at that slide for a bit. Um, and if you have questions on the way, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me. Now we're gonna go ahead and create our Pokemon class. So when you first start making a class, is that too small in the back? No, it's good? Okay, awesome. Um, so when you start, start making a class, you use the class keyword. So here we have class, and the name of our class is Pokemon. We've added two of our data points, which is the name of our Pokemon and the type of our Pokemon. We also have one more data point, if you remember, and that's that the Pokemon has a method, the attack function. So we're gonna go ahead and add that. So there you'll see the function keyword indicates that attack is a function of this class. Um, and for now, it's just doing something and returning a class. Um, a function sort of can return things, doesn't always have to return things, can sometimes do things for you uh, to help you, and sometimes can pass in parameters as well. But for now, our attack function just returns an attack. Now that we have this Pokemon class with really basic properties and an attack function, we need one more thing to create an actual Pokemon. And that's something really special called a constructor. We like to call this a magic method that PHP provides for us. The constructor lets us create objects of a class. And when I say object, I mean an instance of that class. So you have this class that builds this thing called Pokemon for you, which has properties and functions. But you can then go ahead and create an actual Pokemon, and you would call that an object of your Pokemon class. Or you'd be instantiating your Pokemon class. So if you take a look at the last part of that code snippet, we put in our constructor, we passed in our name and type variables, and we initialized them to the ones that are in the class. I tend to talk fast, so I'm just gonna take a break, enjoy the silence, let you look at the code. Cool. This is a cool idea to have a slide. Yes, so uh, the class is kind of like the blueprint. 
We haven't really given it a name or a type. We'll do that when we actually create the object of the class, which is why we've passed the name and the type into the constructor, which means when I'm going to create a Pokemon, I will give you a name and a type for you to fill in into your Pokemon object. That makes sense. Any other questions? Cool. Um, we're gonna, now that we have our class and we have this magic method constructor, we're going to go ahead and create an actual Pokemon object. Um, just as a recap, our constructor takes two parameters, the name and the type. When we want to instantiate a Pokemon object, we use something called a new keyword. And it's basically saying, here's the Pikachu variable, here's the new keyword, create a new Pokemon, which is the name of our class. And we have to pass in the name, which is Pikachu, and the type, which is electric. And this essentially creates a Pikachu for us. And if we want to go one step further, and remember that we had an attack function in this class, we can then use our Pikachu variable and call the attack function using this arrow syntax. And so this is the constructor, takes a name and a type. If you want to create an object for that class, you use the new keyword, you pass in the name and a type, and then when you want to call a method from that class, you can call the method from the object that you created. Um, and just to make this a little bit more real, we're going to look at an example in Drupal core to kind of cement the concept and also give you something that's familiar that you can look at when you're doing your projects. So an example of a class in Drupal core that I picked out was the link class. And you can see I've kind of taken out most of the code, but if we can focus on the constructor for the link class, you pass in a text and a URL object called URL. Don't have to worry too much about the URL object. We'll just focus on what the constructor is doing and that, that it's setting the text and the URL variables within the class. Um, and then we'll look at a place in core where this link constructor is actually used to create a link object that's used in this abstract class entity. In this abstract class entity's to link function, it does a lot of stuff to the variables that are passed in, and then it returns a new link object and passes in the text and the URL that the link constructor needs to create a new link object. Oh, I see someone nodding. It's great. Awesome. So we've been traveling for a while with our Pikachu now. We're going to get back on the road. You know, we're in the forest, and suddenly a wild Pokemon appears, and it's an Oddish. And of course, you have a Pikachu. You have to do battle. You need this Oddish. So we do battle. We get this Oddish. We capture it. And then we're like, wait, what's an Oddish? We only have a Pikachu. Um, so we're going to take a moment and be like, what's an Oddish? What does an Oddish have as data points? How is an Oddish different from a Pikachu? So if we look at our Pokemon now, we have the Pikachu that we already had with the electric type and the attack of Thunderbolt. And then we have an Oddish, which is a grass type and has an attack of poison fire. So it's already quite obvious to us that these are two very different types of Pokemon. But how do we modify our Pokemon class to account for all these different types that we're going to encounter on our journey? Um, and there is a Pokemon concept for this, and we call it inheritance. Inheritance is about sharing. Um, generally, inheritance, you have a parent class and a child class that inherits functionality from that parent class and can also override functionality that you get from that parent class. Um, in our case, for example, um, we'll get to that. Sorry, I skipped ahead. Uh, so this is inheritance. There's a parent class that defines a certain amount of things. There's a child class that can inherit all of those things and then also define its own things and be unique in that way, but also override things that its parents had defined. Um, and PHP is also single inheritance, which means one class can only inherit from, an, from one other class at a time. But that doesn't mean you can't do class inherits from a class that inherits from a class that inherits from class inheritance exception. So you could kind of do that too, um, but just as kind of a reminder, you inherit from one class at a time. So now we're going to look at some Pokemon inheritance. So if you remember, this is our class Pokemon. It's got those properties that we set and that attack function um, and the constructor, just as kind of a recap. And then if we want to extend this class with our electric Pokemon class, which we've decided that now we're going to have type classes for our Pokemon to kind of differentiate between the different types of Pokemon that we'll find. So we're going to create a class electric Pokemon, 
we use the extends keyword to explain that this class is inheriting from the, the class that's after it. So in this case, class electric Pokemon is extending the Pokemon class, which means it's absorbing everything that we see up there and then can define more things or override things. We can go one step further here and take our electric Pokemon class, which extends the Pokemon class. We can define the type variable to be electric, and then we can extend it with a Pikachu class in which we can now change the name variable to Pikachu. And in the attack function, we can actually return the attack that Pikachu has, which is Thunderbolt. And in this way, we've overridden the attack function that we inherited from the electric Pokemon, which inherited it from the Pokemon class. That's a little pew. <laughs> and then what's really cool about this, if we want to go ahead and now we'll create a Pikachu object, it'll look something like this. We'll do Pikachu new Pikachu um, because why did I put that? And when we do the attack function, it'll return Thunderbolt because Pikachu, the Pikachu class has overridden the attack function for the Pokemon class and actually returns a string that says Thunderbolt now. And then we'll go back to Drupal core to look at an example of inheritance. The one I picked here is the widget interface. Um, don't worry too much about the words interface. We'll cover that a little later. What we'll focus on here is that this interface widget interface has this function called form element. And then this interface is implemented by the next class on the next line called widget base. And then widget base is extended by a class called range widget. So essentially it's another hierarchy that's passing all the way down. And class range widget then implements the form element function that came all the way from the widget interface and gives it a form element that has a to and a from because it's a range widget. And so I thought this was a really great example of how you can kind of pass down things and then override them. There's one more thing that I want to cover about inheritance, and that's visibility. So in PHP, we have different types of visibility, um, public, protected, and private. Public visibility means that things that are you know, declared public in a class are accessible excuse me, anywhere. And things that are declared public are accessed only within the class itself and the things that are inheriting from the class. So if something was protected in our Pokemon class, our electric Pokemon class, which was extending our Pokemon class, would be able to access those protected variables. But things that are private are only able to be accessed by the class itself. So when we talk about inheritance, we say that classes, child classes of parent classes only child classes that extend parent classes only inherit the public or protected properties of their parent class. So if there's something private in your parent class, it likely won't be accessible from your child class. I forgot to turn on notifications, so I just got a message. <laughs> so I got distracted. Um, so visibility, super cool. Yes? Yes. So if you have like a protected method in your parent class, you can access, access that from your child class. But if there is a private one, you won't be able to use or override that from your child class. Thanks. Cool. Now that we've covered inheritance and visibility, we're going to go back on the road and check in with our Pokemon. And we're visiting this new town. And we've got our Oddish and our Pikachu. And suddenly, we get challenged to a gym battle. And this is our first gym battle. And we don't do really well because we're like, because you go in there, thunder shock, and we don't really think about strategy or anything like that. Um, so unfortunately, we lose our battle. But that's OK, because lessons learned, and there's always room for improvement. And we learned from our battle with Giovanni that Pokemon have different types of attacks. And different types can have different advantages or strengths and weaknesses. And maybe we should be more strategic about which Pokemon we choose to throw into battle. Um, so from this battle, we've learned that Pokemon can have a strength and a weakness. We're going to have to update our data model. So we have a Pikachu and an Oddish. Um, type and attacks are there, as they were before. But now we've got strengths and weaknesses defined. So the Pikachu has a strength against water type, while the Oddish also has a strength against water type. Um, and the Pikachu has a weakness against ground type, and the Oddish against fire. So that'll kind of help us strategize when we're doing battles in the future. But how do we update our Pokemon classes 
our Pokemon class now to model some of the new information that we've learned. We'll do that with getters and setters. So this is our Pokemon class. I've kind of commented out some stuff to make space, but the properties, the constructor, and the attack method are all still there. Um, I've added two functions you'll see. One is a getter, which is the get weakness function. It'll return the weakness of this Pokemon. And the other is a setter, and it'll return, it'll set the strength for this Pokemon. So you can see that the setter takes in a variable and then sets it to the in, like the member variable in the class. Generally, it's best practice to use getters and setters with your object rather than try to access stuff directly from the object. Um, and then we'll look at getters and setters with inheritance because we have our electric Pokemon class, which extends our Pokemon class. And in here, we're going to set the strength and weakness of this Pokemon according to its type. And then it has other properties and method. And then since we're doing class Pikachu, which extends from the electric Pokemon class, we aren't defining those getters and setters. But because they're in the class, the parent Pokemon class, we do have access to them. So if we do something like creating a new Pikachu object and get weakness, it'll return the weakness that we've set in one of the parent classes. Cool, I see people nodding. Yes. So now we're going to go and look at some getters and setters in Drupal core. Uh, the example I picked was from the route match class, which implements the route match interface. In this class, they have a function called get parameter, which I use quite often. And what it does is it returns the parameters. Um, so route match helps you get like the routes that are a part of the URL on a page. Um, so get parameter will tell you what parameters are in that URL string on the page that you're on. Um, and the way that they do this is they load the service, which is route match. And don't worry about that too much. We'll cover that later. But then they call the get parameters function from the route match service. And they call the method on that. So that's like an example of a getter in a Drupal class, in a, in a class that's in Drupal core. Uh, I'm going to take a quick recap because I know we've been kind of spinning through inheritance quite fast. We have a class Pokemon, and then we have a class Electric Pokemon, which extends the parent Pokemon class. And then we have a class Pikachu, which extends the Electric Pokemon class, which means we can do both of these things. The first section there is us creating a new Pokemon, passing in a name and a type as Pikachu and Electric, and then calling the attack method on that Pokemon. But since that Pokemon is a Pokemon type, it's calling that generic attack method from the Pokemon parent class, which doesn't really know what Pikachu's actual attack is. And we can also go ahead and create a Pikachu and call the attack method. And since the Pikachu and extends the electric Pokemon class, it already knows that it's electric. And it already knows that its name is Pikachu. Um, and what it also does is return that Thunderbolt attack, which is specific to Pikachu. So when we're looking at this code here, I was thinking, we don't want to create generic Pokemon anymore. We have typed Pokemon. We have classes for specific Pokemon. So how can we still keep the functionality that we have in that parent Pokemon class and be able to create multiple types of Pokemon, but not be able to create this generic Pokemon object that causes way too much data, way too much data? Um, and OOP gives us a way of doing this called interfaces. Interfaces are like contracts. So it's kind of code that specifies that a class must implement everything that's in the code. It's kind of like a contract. So you have to agree to certain rules. Um, everything in the interface is public, and the class has to implement that's everything in there. So in our case, our Pokemon class will be our interface. Also, you can't instantiate an interface. So you can't create a type of an interface. You have to implement it in a class, and then you can create an object of that class. So we'll look at that with Pokemon. First, we'll take a look at our interface for Pokemon, Pokemon interface. Um, and I've thrown in a couple of you know, Pokemon methods in there, like set the Pokemon name, the attack method that we looked at before, the get strength method, the get weakness method. All these methods are public. And you'll notice something weird, that they don't actually have any bodies defined. They don't do anything. And that's because this is an interface. And the class is going to have to do all the work. Um, so how do we use this interface? 
I'm just putting that there with just one method so that you remember what it looks like. And then in our class electric Pokemon, we use the implements keyword to signify that we're going to implement the Pokemon interface. And in our electric Pokemon class, we've defined the type to be electric. And we'll take that get Pokemon type from the Pokemon interface and give it some functionality, which is returning the type, just for now. And then we can go one step forward. And in our Pikachu class, which is extending the electric Pokemon class, which is implementing the Pokemon interface, um, we can take that get Pokemon type and also return a type. So you can do it in either. So now that we have this Pokemon interface, we can't go ahead and create generic Pokemons. But then that makes us think, do we want to create generic electric Pokemons? Because we have Pikachu as a class. Because um, that's kind of weird, too. Because if we're going to have more electric Pokemons on our travels, we might as well create classes for them, too. Um, so for the Pokemon interface, we wanted to keep a functionality that could be like a parent class, but we didn't have to instantiate it. Um, for the electric Pokemon class, there's also a way to make this so that it's sort of functionality that we can use, but we can't necessarily create an object of. And we call that an abstract class. An abstract class is kind of like a skeleton. Um, it provides you some functionality, and it's commonly used as a base class for things. But it can never be instantiated, which is per perfectly for us, for our electric Pokemon class. Cool, someone nodded. This was a last minute addition. Um, cool, we're going to look at our abstract electric Pokemon class. Just a recap on our interface, we have that get Pokemon type function defined in it. Um, and here's our electric Pokemon class. You'll see that I've added the abstract keyword before the class to define that this class is in fact abstract. Um, and in that abstract class, uh, in the get Pokemon type function, I'm returning electric as the type of the Pokemon. And then in our Pikachu class, which extends electric Pokemon, we're kind of inheriting that get Pokemon type function. So when we create a Pikachu object and we call get Pokemon type, it's going to return electric. Yes. So the abstract class can define the bodies of methods. But the interface can only give you the function definition, like just the function names. So the interface is like everything that's in here, it's only methods, it's all public, you have to implement it. Whereas the abstract class is a little more flexible. It can give you things like in this case, the electric Pokemon class is abstract, but it's kind of doing the work for you. So when you extend it, you kind of just use what's implemented in that function. So it's got like method bodies. I don't think so. I think you always implement an interface. But it could be wrong. Can you extend an interface? Oh, I got a thumbs up. Is that a yes? You can? OK. Maybe that's out of scope for a beginner session. <laughs> Extending an interface and all the other weird things OOP lets you do that maybe you shouldn't be able to do. Yes. Yes. That's the contract. <laughs> I have in my notes, woohoo, inheritance interfaces and abstract class all on the same slide. <laughs> it only gets easier. OK, we're going to go ahead and look at an example in Drupal core that I really like. It's the form interface. It implements this function called get form ID. And then in the form base class, which is an abstract class, it implements the form interface. And then when you're creating a custom form or you're looking at forms in Drupal core like user login, they generally extend form base because that's the base class for forms. And they implement the function that was being passed from the interface. So form base signed this contract and user login form uh, implemented it and gave its ID for the form. And I make a lot of custom forms, so. 
I'm sure there's stuff in it. Um, for the sake of the code on the slide, I only kind of focused on, so the form interface provides a lot of functions, and the form base class also provides a lot of really useful functionality. Um, but um, for the sake of the code, I wanted to focus specifically on the getFormID function and show how that kind of travels through the inheritance into your custom form. I'm going to repeat um, for recording. Um, so what he was saying was that one of the things that the form base class actually provides for you, which is really great, is the uh, validate and submit handlers. Um, and, and they'll kind of do that work for you so you don't have to write your own submit handler when you submit the form, unless you want to do special things, which is usually always. <laughs> Oops. Um, cool. We're going to go back to our story. Is everyone kind of clear on this? Kind of. Um, it gets easier as you do it more. So I would encourage you to just kind of dive in. So we're back in our story, and all of a sudden, you know, we're at this lake, and our Charmeleon, I guess we got a new Pokemon, now we have a Charmeleon, is evolving into a Charizard. But now we have to update our data model. So we know that not all Pokemon can evolve, and so we can't add that to the interface. And some Pokemon evolve in different ways. Sometimes you give them a special stone. Sometimes you did really well, and they're happy, and they want to grow. Um, and so that depends on you know, the exact Pokemon, and not necessarily the type. So how do we model this ability to evolve without putting it in our base class or in our interface? PHP gives us this really cool ability called traits. I did a funny. <laughs> Before we get to traits, this was the data model slide um, that I didn't finish. But you have a Charmeleon and a Charizard. The one on the left evolves to the one on the right. And how do we model that in our base class? Since all Pokemon don't evolve, we use traits. Traits are like code snippets. I like to call them code copy pasta. Um, <laughs> it's a form of code reuse that doesn't involve inheritance, um, and it kind of you know gives you another way to bring some code into your class and to bring it into any class essentially. Um, it, do, it cannot be instantiated, so you can't create an object of a trait. You can't do like new trait something, um, but you can use a trait in your class, and then you have access to all the functionality that your trait is providing. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And first, we're going to create our own trait, a Poke Evolution trait. And in there, we're going to add this evolve function, which returns a new object according to something that we're passing called a next stage. In our Charmeleon, I actually don't know how to say that, Charmeleon Pokemon class, which extends Fire Pokemon class, we're going to do the use keyword, which means we're going to use this trait in this class. Um, so it says use Poke Evolution trait, which means we're, we're getting all the functionality from the Poke Evolution trait that we defined. And we're also defining something called next stage, which is a you know, property of this Charmeleon class, and we're setting that to Charizard. So, and the class Charizard extend, also extends the Fire Pokemon class. So when we want to create a Charmeleon, we do the new keyword, we use the Charmeleon, but when we call the evolve, some evolve function on our Charmeleon, some magic happens. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that happens is that we create this Charmeleon, and we've set the next stage variable in the Charmeleon class to Charizard. So Charmeleon knows my next stage of evolution is a Charizard. And we're using the Poke Evolution trait, which provides the evolve method for us. And the evolve method returns a new object according to itself and to the next stage. So we're telling it my next stage is Charizard, and then we're returning a Charizard through the trait. Yes? So would you not want to set Charmeleon equal to Charmeleon evolve in order? Yes, you would. So basically, object been created, but it's not being mapped. It's not being mapped to an object right now, yes. Um, so the second line of the code there, if you actually want your Charizard object, you would do Charizard variable equals Charmeleon evolve. I guess I didn't cover namespaces. <laughs> Um, but if they were in the same namespace, I guess you could use it. And if it wasn't, then you would have to, you know, put the use definition in the top of your class. Sorry. Yes, you you just have to include it at the top of the file. It 
it's kind of like a, a file of its own. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a pokeevolution trait.php. <laughs> Cool. We're going to go ahead and look at an example of traits in Drupal. Uh, a really popular one or one that you use and maybe you don't know comes from a trait is the string translation trait, which has a T function. Um, and this T function returns a new translatable markup with a lot of cool stuff in it. Um, and that's used in the plugin base class. Um, and the way it's used is use string translation trait. It uses the use keyword to use the functionality from the string translation trait, which means when you go ahead and create a plugin or when you extend an existing plugin, which extends plugin base, you're getting that T function to have translatable markup. So if you've ever used the T function, it's kind of coming from another place, which is a trait. My code says much wow. <laughs> I think I left that in there to stay relaxed. It's great. You know, I always think sometimes some they should have like conferences with at least one session room that has sofas instead of chairs. So people can just be like chill. And then the speaker can be like, yeah, everyone's chilling. It's great. Everything's great. <laughs> like it's just like long cedar sofas. They, they have those old hotels or like theaters that have long cedar sofas. So we're about to dive into some interesting stuff now. Um, feel free to ask questions at any point. This is going to be fun. So we go back to our journey, and something exciting happens. Oh, question. Rather than a method? Um, so the reason, uh, specifically in our Pokemon example, that's okay. Um, the reason that we're using the evolution trait here is because I have different Pokemon classes. And if I were to create a method, um, I would have to create it in each, you know, in the electric Pokemon class, in the fire Pokemon class. Um, and in our specific story, evolution doesn't depend on the type. It depends on specifically the Pikachu or specifically the Charizard. And how they evolve also depends on the Pokemon. So if we put that method in our parent classes, we kind of have to use it in all the classes that extend them. And they might not necessarily need to evolve. So a trait is an example of a thing that you might only have to use in very small cases um, and doesn't apply to all of the things. Um, and so it, it kind of lets you plug something in without um, forcing everyone else to use it as well. Okay. Yes. That is one, one sort of um, explanation for why to use traits is just uh, you can avoid inheritance, and unfortunately, it's single inheritance, so here's some copy pasta. <laughs> oh, oh, no, I spoiled it. <laughs> so something exciting happened on our journey, and we won our first badge, and it kind of looks like a Drupal badge. Um, so now that we've won badges, we're like, oh, no, we have to model this in our code. And we need to have a system that you know, lets us earn badges. And badges system is another functionality that can change because different badges have different requirements. Um, and so something in OOP that lets us implement this uh, kind of thing, which is a system and that has different requirements and different types, are called plugins. And plugins are like functional Lego blocks. Uh, you can kind of just use them. There are many different types of plugins. And there are many different types of existing plugins in Drupal. Um, there's, I think of plugins as there's a bunch of different behaviors they can do, but they're in a common interface. And not interface in the sense of the interfaces that we've talked about, but interface in the sense of English language. <laughs> so there's a thing. They all work kind of differently, but they all kind of look the same, that common interface. Um, so in Drupal, there are many existing types of plugins. There's annotated plugins, YAML plugins for like menus, hook and discovery plugins. And generally, I think, you would extend an existing plugin to do some work. So you, you know, making a custom plugin takes a lot of work. You have to like create all these fancy things like a plugin manager and a plugin interface and your own custom plugin base. So if we go down this route of creating a Drupal badge plugin, it's really not in scope for a beginner session. So we're going to shift gears a little bit here and maybe do a mixture of Drupal and Pokemon at the same time. It's like a crossover. So if you get confused, feel free to ask questions. So instead of creating a custom plugin, we're going to extend an existing plugin. And the one that I've selected is the 
block base plugin, which is the base class plugin for when you create a custom block. Um, a block is what we call an annotation type, an annotation based plugin. It's a type of plugin which is called an annotation plugin. Um, an annotation is that fancy looking comment that's right above the class definition. Um, it's this key value structure that defines what that plugin does. For example, where it says at block, it's telling you, it's telling Drupal, this is a block plugin. Um, and we can go more detail into what goes into the class, but for now we're focusing on this idea that um, blocks are annotation-based plugin, which is a type of plugin that Drupal provides. And here we're gonna make a profile block for our Pokemon. So we're kind of shifting gears and thinking more about websites now. So, you know, placing a block on your website about your Pokemon. So kind of coming out of the abstraction a little to understand plugins. Um, Annotation-based plugins are great because they let you do a lot of complex things in the annotation. Um, you can indicate which strings can be translated, and they also use less memory when discovering plugins. So we're going to take a closer look into our Pokemon profile block. Um, so in our Pokemon profile block, which extends block base, um, we're doing some fancy stuff with a container, and we're returning in our build function and we're turning a render array. Um, we don't have to worry about that too much. It's just that there's a build function that comes from block base that lets us put things in our block, um, and so that's what we're doing here. Um, and we did this because creating custom plugins is a lot of work and maybe not a beginner thing, so we're just gonna extend an existing plugin, which is block base, and we created a Pokemon profile block. Does that make sense? I'm going to repeat that. Annotation uh, annotations do magic for you sometimes. So where we saw that annotation, and I'll go back a slide, that says at block, says, hey, Drupal, we have a block here. So when you go to structure block layout, you'll actually see that block in your list of blocks now. Even if it, no. Cool. Um, cool. Oh, it's 11.22. I don't know when this session ends. <laughs> Whoa, okay, cool, thanks. So we're gonna go back to our story. We won a lot of battles and a lot of fame, and someone comes up to us and says, you should compete in the leagues. And you're like, the leagues? Why would I compete in the leagues? To be the very best. <laughs> <laughs> and so before you can join the competition though, you need to submit your trainer profile. And your trainer profile includes statistics about your Pokemon and you know how many battles they've won, what evolution state they're at, what their power levels are. And let's just say that the Pokemon world has been doing you a favor and storing them in a database somewhere. And all you have to do is access them. So OOP provides us a functionality for kind of retrieving things in a pluggable way. And we call those services. I think of services as swappable operations. Um, you have same functionalities, but you can implement them in different ways. So it's same function, but swappable code. You can have two services that do the same thing, but are different services, so you can swap them out whenever you want. Um, they're globally available, so you can use them in any class, and there's usually an interface that defines those methods for the service. And some examples would be accessing, accessing a database, sending an email, or translating interface text. to slam the bottle into the mic. Cool. Cool, 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 cool. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and look at our Pokemon interface. I mean, sorry. <laughs> We're gonna go look at the interface for our Pokemon data service. Um, it's generally good practice that when you're defining a new service, you should first define an interface for it. So in our interface, we define a function called get yearly stats, which takes a Pokemon interface object, or Pokemon, and an integer for the year that it is. And then we go ahead and create our service. It's class Poke Data Service. It implements that Poke Data interface and then provides the method functionality for that get yearly stats method, which is just some magic query stuff for now, and returns an array of data. Cool. 
And then how do we use this service? We go ahead and create a Pikachu. And then we load the service by creating a variable called Pokedata Helper. And if you look at the syntax with the slash Drupal service, that's basically saying, call me, I want to call a global service, and I pass in the ID of that service. And now if we want to call a method from the service, we use the arrow syntax, and we call get yearly syntax, get yearly stats, and we pass in our Pikachu and the year that we want the data for. Then we're going to take a look at some services in Drupal. Drupal core provides a lot of services that you can use. You can see all of them in the core services.yaml file. One of them in there defined is the current user service, which comes from the account proxy class. And if you want to use the current user service, you do something like this. You set a current user variable, and you use the global service call, and then you put in the ID of the service, which is current user, and then you can access something from the current user object. Is everyone still with me? Symphony. Symphony is why they're called services. <laughs> yes? Are annotations PHP or is that a symphony construct? I don't know, but maybe someone here knows. Neither. I use call the audience. No. It's a plug into Symphony as well. Yes? One at a time, as far as I'm aware. I guess if you wanted to load more services, you would give each of them a, like a variable. So uh, for example, here you're doing current user variable is holding the service that you're, you're bringing in. Um, so if you wanted to use multiple services, it would be best to have a variable for each of them so that you can access each of their methods separately. That's next. <laughs> Which is why I wanted to take a break and be like, is everyone still with me? Because it's about to get crazy. Just kidding. It's going to be great. So advantage for services is that they lazy load, they're globally available, and they don't take up a lot of memory. Did I get that? Only when you use them is when they, when they use up memory. Pro tips. All right, so we're going to move on. I keep saying this like we're loading the service globally, um, but there is another way to load our services, and that's dependency injection. So when possible, you want to inject your services. You can pass them in as an argument to your constructor, or you can use setter methods to load in your service containers. Um, rather than calling that global services, it's better to load services into your class and then use them that way. Um, many of the controller and plugin classes that Core provides uses this pattern. So if you ever go into those, those you know, if you ever dig into Core, you'll kind of see really good examples of this. Um, do you remember our Pokemon profile info block? And we were using, and now we're going to go ahead and inject our Pokemon data service into our Pokemon info profile block. So here's our Pokemon profile block. The first step to do dependency injection is to extend this fancy thing called container factory plugin interface. You can copy paste it from another thing. Um, and the key to making plugins to use dependency injection is to implement that, because that gives us a lot of functionality to inject our services. Um, so when plugins are created, the, first, the code first checks, hey, are you implementing this container factory plugin interface? And if so, it gives you these two special functions or methods called create and, and then looks for your constructor. Um, so first we're going to implement our constructor in which we're passing in our Pokedata interface, which is our service, the Pokedata service, and then we're initializing it in the constructor. So we're extending the, we're <laughs> implementing the Container Factory plugin interface, and then in our constructor, we're initializing our Pokedata service. 
And then in this create function, which the Container Factory plugin interface provides for us, um, we're getting the Poke data service from the container. And now, anywhere in our class, we can use this Poke data service variable and have access to all of the methods that were in our service. So essentially, in these three steps, we have injected our service into our class. I'm going to try to repeat your question first. Um, is it by implementing the Container Factory plugin interface that Drupal knows to go to the create function to uh, call the to get the container for this to get the service from the container oh, to, to, to create the object for the service rather than just, saying, create rather than just creating a new call, call, okay. I think it knows because it implements the Container Factory service, but yes, people are nodding. So yes, when you implement the Container Factory plugin interface, Drupal knows that there's going to be a create function that's going to get that service into the, from the container for you. Questions? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he said, what is a container? Do you also want to give me the answer? I, I kind of know, but I don't know how to put it in words in a way that, like, I don't want to scare people away. So, how would you describe a container? ELI five. Explain it to me like I'm five. A container is a thing. It's a bucket that Drupal provides that has a lot of services in it, and you can get services from it. Um, a box of toys, that's what the container is. Awesome. Okay, so the container can only spin up, uh, does only spin up one copy of the service and just keeps track of that service for you. So a box of toys has a lot of toys in there. Toys are services, <laughs> and you can get them when you need them. So this is dependency injection. Um, and that's all I've got. The adventure continues. There's a lot out there in OP, and there's a lot that I've only covered the sort of surface of. Um, but as you do more back-end work and as you do more code, you'll kind of you know, interact with new things and discover new things. And I would encourage you not to be afraid, because if you could do it with Pokemon, you could do it with, for your client for custom forms. Um, and each of you has the potential to write back-end code. I know you do, because I'm up here and I do. So <laughs> we're all in this together. Um, I hope this session kind of provides a foundation for the basics and kind of helps you form ideas when you're, you know, facing new challenging concepts. Um, and um, let's all be awesome programmers. Um, I wish I could give everyone a Drupal badge, like the one we got in that picture, um, but I can't. But I can give you the slides, and that's the bit.ly to the slides. Keep in touch with me. I'm Sugar Overflow on everything. And a special thank you to Kotzer for mentoring me on these slides and really helping me figure out how to get this abstraction into a way that could you know, help people understand and feel more comfortable about back-end concepts. Questions? I would create a custom block and then be like, hey, maybe I want to put some special things in my block, and then take that build function and go wild. And then maybe find a service, like use the current user stuff and be like, I want to display the current user's name, age, and email in my custom block. Um, and start there and, and start to like sort of expand on that. Um, if you're not a block fan, create a custom form. You're also extending a base class. And then put some fancy things into your form. Can you do a plug for the examples module? Plug for the examples module.
So PHP Storm is one of those IDEs, and others also have this intelligent sense that when you click on a class that you're extending, you can kind of travel through the inheritance or implementations to see where those functions are coming from. And that's really useful for beginners, because you can kind of see where the errors are coming from, or you can see what other functionality that base class provides for you that you don't have to write yourself. Um, if you have Sublime Text, you can do Control Shift P and start typing things in. And when you type an interface, it's like all the interfaces for your fuzzy search. Um, so that's what I did when I was doing this. I just like Control F, the core folder. <laughs> and, was, and we were like looking for somewhere where a link was created. Control F for new link parentheses. And then we're like, does this one make sense? Oh, this one kind of makes OK. And that's kind of how we found those core examples. Question. I learned on Drupalize Me. I know it's not free, so it's maybe not a resource for everyone. Um, I know Code Academy uh, is that one with, that does the like interactive code tutorials. Has one on PHP that goes quite in depth into like extending things and interfaces. Um, so that might be useful. But for very very specific Drupal-y and Symphony things, uh, I would go to Drupalize Me. They also have this really great page um, they call uh, Unraveling. Drupal 8 plugins, where they use the example of an ice cream factory, and they teach you how to make a custom plugin, the thing that I didn't want to talk about because it was too complicated. But that's a great read, and it's got a lot of pictures. <laughs> it's not free anymore? <sighs> so plug for Drupal console. If you, you know, type in a command, it builds the module for you. Check your local library, because they will probably want to teach you programming. <laughs> Can we take one from like back here with everyone in the picture? Yes. Any other questions? Sorry? I haven't mentioned namespaces, no. I guess, I guess if you want me to explain namespaces on demand, um, what would, how would I explain namespaces? It's a thing that holds the code that you create and owns it. <laughs> oh, yeah, look like folders. Yes, namespaces are like folders. I will add that slide. Namespaces are like folders. If you're in that folder, you can call things that are in that namespace or folder. Um, and if you're not, then you have to use the namespace at the top of your class. So there's a lot out there. Are you ready? Yes. Everyone, Drupal. So that, <laughs> thank you. That was my first ever solo session, and you have been a wonderful audience. Thank you.